Okay, so uh, thanks for coming here at this hour between uh, when you're getting hungry and uh, eventually lunches. Uh, and thanks for inviting me. So when uh, Nikolai approached me and asked whether I want to give a talk on training and monitoring AI, I said, of course, yes. Um, and in a way, that's a <laughs> happy little accident and not a mistake. Um, but I quickly thought about what might be most interesting to you, and so I narrowed it down to a very specific topic, uh, which is drift detection. Um, but if that is kind of mundane to you, uh, maybe you're as excited as I am about uh, uh, all these neural image generators, and you can try to, for some of them I put that on, but for the others you can try to guess who's artists uh, name I included in the prompts. Um, okay, so uh, uh, my goal in this talk, and I will, it will be a bit high level, and my goal is to show you, just like Holly did very skillfully, <laughs> more than I can probably this morning, I want to show you a gap of how we approach the question of whether our uh, neural networks, our deep learning models, our AIs uh, work. And so about me, um, maybe I do this from the bottom, I do some open source. Um, I have a blog where I nerd out with formulas and tech and CUDA code and stuff like that. Um, I also have a PhD in pen and paper mathematics, but I can promise you no formulas here. I always keep them for the party later on. <laughs> Um, okay, so uh, I founded my own company, MathInf, an upcoming AI consulting empire, uh, to do mostly PyTorch training and consulting. So I'm usually talking to vastly more specialized audiences, but it's great uh, to have the opportunity to reach out to you. Um, and usually I do things like integrated prototyping and know-how building, so we combine training and consulting. Um, I often do from slow to fast because, you know, these GPUs are so expensive, you want to really get to 100% utilization with them. Um, and from does not quite work to works, just like you do usually in your domain too. Um, more recently, I've been moving from consulting to more traditional software startup with lots of drift detection, and so it's no surprise that this is what I want to talk to you about. Um, I also wrote with two of my friends uh, this uh, little book, and whenever you do things wrong in deep learning and testing your models, I will look like that, uh, and the beard grows like that too. Um, it's a book that tries to take you in a lighthearted way uh, from some Python to uh, your first neural network end-to-end -end project. Um, and I did all this because I uh, kind of found PyTorch when it was new and when I was looking for something new to do. And so uh, I just love uh, PyTorch so much that I uh, have 170 features and bug fixes on this. So if the CTC loss doesn't quite work as well as it should, uh, usually the blame is on me. Uh, yeah, that's just how it goes. When your batch norm is really fast, that's uh, something I did too. Okay, about the book, um, really quick, a bit of advertisement for that, um, because I think you're pretty much, or some of you are part of the target audience, so we aim, to introduce PyTorch and convolutional neural nets for people that know some programming in Python. Um, and in part two, we take you through an end-to-end -end project where we take lung CT scans uh, and look for lung cancer, essentially. Um, so we kind of fall into some of the things, uh, some of the traps, and we show you how to fall into them and also how to get out. And then we have a little bit about how to get that on your mobile phone or on a service or something like that. Um, and just like the talk, we don't do formulas. Um, it's not on the book table, but if you use the QR code, you get a 30% discount, which is usually hard to get for the hard copy in, in uh, Europe. 
Okay, so what I what do I want to uh, discuss with you, and uh, what do I want you to think about today, um, and see what we do is uh, about drift detection as an essential exercise to deployment to quality assurance of our uh, AI models. And I'll do this in three steps. Why and how does it work? There the mathematician will uh, kind of come out a bit. And then uh, uh, what do we need to do in order to uh, actually close this gap in testing our models? So the first thing is, why do we want to detect drift? Well, neural networks are very successful in a wide range of applications. So to my mind, imaging is probably one of the greatest applications of deep learning uh, because it works very reliably. We have a reasonable understanding what's going on. And in often in things, especially when it goes to 3D things like medical imaging, um, or when you need to do it really fast, like quality inspection in industry, uh, it is really, really powerful. Um, many of these applications have a strong requirement for accuracy in various shapes and forms. So sometimes you have to watch out for false positives. Sometimes the false negatives are uh, very crucial, for example, in quality insurance. Um, but so we typically don't know whether a neural network works just by looking at it. Instead, we test and test and test. So we throw data at it that we think is the data that it should work on. And then we check, does it work? And if it does, yeah, then we're ready to deploy. But so the question is, were these really the right inputs to test our models with? And the answer is, we hope. Because if we don't, if things go out of specification, and in this business, I would say the specification is, yeah, works as I have tested on, which is kind of a lot less of a specification than you probably are happy with, but what can I do? Um, if things go out of spec, well, if your model had any business value, if you save money by using AIs or made money by using AIs, if it doesn't work properly, that advantage goes to the drain. Uh, sometimes you have safety issues, like if you have AI-assisted medical diagnosis, you might miss something, or even if you have like control loops, things go out of hand a lot fast if you have a systematically wrong output. Um, and there's also this compliance part. If you use these AIs and something goes wrong, people will ask, yeah, what did you do to check that things are all right? Um, I've been working in the financial industry before I moved to AI. Uh, and so uh, some of these industries uh, uh, have really heavy requirements. And when things go wrong, people will find all the requirements that they weren't aware of before. These things do happen. And so uh, in medical devices, for example, you have that uh, some things are not as normed as they should be. For example, in MRT machines, uh, you might so suddenly have different output levels or a different output range from having a different device. And so you want to detect that, well, yeah, our inputs are not quite what we expect them to be. Um, similar in recommender systems, you don't want to wait until you notice the declining sales performance. Holly this morning said, well, yeah, <laughs> when you have the accounting catch up to us, then it's too late, right? And so uh, we want to be proactive there too. And in visual QA, well, yeah, maybe something hit the camera or something is dirty on the camera. And now it doesn't work anymore. It doesn't spot any defects, but they might be there and we might be missing them. So now good. I've told you the answer is drift detection, but I didn't quite tell you what that is. So who knows what drift is? <laughs> okay, three hands. 
So uh, maybe these three hands are evidence that there is a thing called drift. Um, people make a whole scientific classification out of this. They distinguish input drift, where the inputs change, label drift, where the outputs change, and concept drifts, where the inputs and the outputs are the same, but the right answers get mixed up. Um, and thus can happen gradually, or it can happen suddenly, then it's a regime change. But all these things are very well. As a practitioner, my question is, do the assurances of the model validation that I did still apply in our deployment? And if things have drifted, I'm saying no, because I'm seeing different data than I have uh, tested the model on. If we want to put this in a flowchart, we can ask ourselves, can I trust my model to work? And so if I didn't validate my model, all bets are off anyways. So if I have labeled data cheaply, and so if you Google drift detection, and obviously I'm a consultant, you should never believe my advice, but inform yourself independently. <laughs> um, so if you Google this, you will find drift detection solutions that implicitly assume you have labeled data cheaply. Um, if that is the case, of course, lucky you, you can do an ongoing validation uh, using production data. In many cases, in particular in visual applications, we find that we don't have that. Then the question is, can our models say, I don't know? Do they know what they don't know, or are they just overconfident, just like you and me sometimes? Um, it turns out, again, there's solutions that say, well, once we have solved this problem of overconfidence, maybe by scaling down the confidence from 99.9% .9 really means I'm right 80% of the time or something of it like that. Um, if that works, that's all cool. You might still do drift detection to supplement this diagnosis. Um, but if you still have this overconfidence problem, or you might have it partially, you still have the problem that you don't know if the confidence your model expresses really matches to how good it is, really. Okay, I still didn't tell you what drift really was. Um, so what do we do? We have inputs and we have outputs. And so uh, in, generally, in general, <laughs> We don't know what the right output would be in production. So we say, well, is it plausible that there is some statistical distribution that both the testing data and the production data came from? Is it plausible that they came from the same thing? Or did someone change something behind my back? And so this is the classical domain of statistics. And statistics is a superpower, and you see here, statistics class is full of Superman, even if you only put in one in the prompt. Um, so what we do is we have a thing called statistical two-sample testing, and it's a very classic thing, goes back to Kolmogorov and Smirnov, and so there's lots of fancy literature. The thing is that you need to spice it up with fancy kernel methods uh, that you've heard when you've about when you are in data science. But essentially, you, we can use statistics as our basis. And we will just say, yeah, we have a statistical test that answers us, is the production data we see the same as the data we use to test? Or are they from the same distribution? Are they plausibly from the same distribution? Who has heard of outlier detection? OK, that's a few more than I, when I asked about drift. So what's the difference to outlier detection here? Um, outlier detection checks whether a single input is plausible, plausibly from the distribution that I tested with. Um, but this is not enough, because one of the things we see in practice is that well, any individual 
point in a degenerated regime where we have where our inputs don't match anymore what we have tested against the neural network will just well have a lot of i don't know this is kind of the average thing of what i'm always seeing uh, uh types of features so what we see is that we have a concentration to everything is extraordinarily average and uh, so an outlier detection system will not find that but if you have like all my things are exactly average you should get suspicious and so you need to look at a number of inputs at the same time in order to to detect this we also don't do adversarial detection. Who knows about adversarial inputs to neural networks? Yeah, so uh, for a while they were very popular. Like you could have a little sticker on the stop sign so the autonomous driving things think that it's a go fast sign or something like that. Um, so we're not doing this here because it's a kind of different type of problem and in particular Drift detection won't help you because the adversarial examples are designed to be undetectable. The next thing we see is, well, yeah, we ask this question, are they from the same distribution? And the answer is, no, they never are. And the reason is that for all sorts of applications we have, we cannot expect that our inputs that we see in a given time frame are representative of all the inputs we ever see. So for example, we might have summer and winter seasons here. Um, if you remember the picture I showed you right at the beginning, you saw the lake with the boat detector. And so that was from June, <laughs> and this is from October, just like right now. And what happens is that people pull their boats out. And that's not something that is bad and our system stopped working. Um, but it is something, if you just measure the distance to a typical summer day, it will, it will show. And similarly, you might have batches of different parts that pass by the same quality inspection station. Or you might have lighting that changes over the uh, time of the day or in whatever shape and form. Uh, other usage that depends on the searches depend on the day of the week or the weather or something like that. So what do we do here? Well, first we drop to a toy problem in order to do a little nerd out here. So the conventional answer with that is, well, yeah, all these drift detections give you little scores, and if there's like a fluctuation, you just move the bar for the alarm up high enough, and if you like hit the orange line, then <laughs> it's safe during all the year. But this means that we miss legitimately <laughs> drifted things. So in this toy example here, you have the test distribution, that is the two blue blobs, and now all of the sudden we just have our, all our input points in one uh, of these blobs and the drift score will be 0 0.36. Doesn't mean anything, um, it's just a distance function. But more distance is further away. So if we move the score then up and we say, well, don't sound the alarm at 0 0.36 then, but only at 0 0.5, whatever, um, then we'll miss things that are legitimately drifted. For example, uh, down here, uh, if we have something that moved just in between the two modes where it shouldn't be. So what do we do? Well, this is kind of one of the things where the statisticians come in and have a little thing and uh, what you need to do is you need to bridge the gap between uh, drift detection, which asks, well, is this data we see in production, is this representative of all our validation data, to, well, is it representative of part of the validation data? And this is kind of halfway to, 
is the single data point representative of a single data point of the validation data that we use in outlier detection. And so from matching all to matching part, and you can see this if I draw the matching that is implicitly there when you calculate distances, uh, you see that when I try to match everything, it's just a mass. And when I try to match it properly, you can hardly see the matching because they're just so close. And so this is really uh, something when we started out, we said, well, yeah, we can just do two sample testing. And then uh, half a year later, we found, no, this doesn't really work. Um, <laughs> and then last year, we got this partial matching. And now uh, several of the open source projects implement some shape of partial matching. You can either automatically match that, and this is what I did, or, or you can have like a function that tells you which part you should match to. Okay, so far this was mathematics, statistics, and that's all good. And I can't help it, I'm a mathematician. I always like to talk about mathematics. Um, but so <laughs> what I didn't tell you was what should we really do to detect these drifts? And so here's here's the question. Here are the kind of things that you. Well, yeah, I want to use to sample testing, uh, and that's the easy part. But what do you do? What will be the inputs you feed into the to sample testing? Um, and the problem is that, well, I could use just the input images, like they're all pixel values, and that's like a huge vector, and I can feed that into my machine. Um, but in the end, most of that will not be relevant. Or I can say, yeah, well, I can just use the outputs, and if something funny happens with the outputs, I will detect that. If I have good or bad, I have like two outputs. Um, you say one, but I say two. Um, and uh, and uh, I can just detect on that, but then I will incur the model blindness problem, that the, something that my model didn't see, the drift detection won't see either. So that doesn't work, but if, you, if you've seen neural networks, you can cut them somewhere in the middle, and then you have a good chance that you miss out some of the Ill irrelevant bits and focus on the on the important stuff and not miss too much of the important stuff. The other part is this curse of dimensionality. You see this here. I have all these two-dimensional pictures, and there will be people that go with one-dimensional pictures when they discuss drift detection. Um, so it's not only harder to draw if you have 100 dimensions instead of two, but it's also statistically harder. So uh, <laughs> you have this curse of dimensionality. If you go for the high dimensions, you will not miss things because it's statistically hard, or you project it to lower dimensions, then you will miss it because uh, you have projected it down. And somewhere in between is the best you can do. The other question is to when to sound the alarm. So who of you knows statistical testing? So the crucial quantity is that sets the alarm level. It's the p-value. And the p-value gives you, and now the nerd is on again, the p-value gives you, if you repeat this experiment good enough, and the null hypothesis, which in this game is everything's okay, so if everything is okay, and I have a p-value of something, then every p -th test will just say, yeah, something is up, even though it isn't. That's all well. If I ask somebody, who is, what's your favorite p-value, you get answers like 5% if they're in academia and want to publish their research, or 1% or half a percent.
But really, if you run this drift detection 1,000 times a day, and you don't want 50 false alarms a day, then you are at p-values that are a lot lower with your statistical testing. Um, if we move the alarm level like we did before in the would-be example where we say, well, yeah, don't sound the alarm that often, Basically, what we're saying is, well, yeah, screw all the statistics. They don't work anyway. I'm just going to make something up, which is, of course, something that we will all do, but only as a last resort. If we can avoid it for a while, let's go as far as we can without fudging the, with the statistics. Uh, the other part, and this is the good news here, is that the statistics might be oversensitive in the sense that our model really performs well even in regions where the statistical testing will already say it has drifted. And this is a good news because our models are more stable than we might think they are. Um, but then really we should kind of expand our testing to the, to the area where it works and then have this as, uh, as good. And of course, the key question is, or the, the question when you've ticked all the boxes is, well, how do you integrate this into the operation? Um, sorry. So these uh, first questions were all, the first question, which features to use, and how to calibrate this. This is all what we do when we set up our model. So we need to do some baselining. We say, this is what we've tested. This is our reference distribution. Um, and we configure the alarms. And then there's the second part, and this is what we need to do ongoing. We need to independently or in conjunction with the running of the model, uh, uh, we need to feed our inputs, the features that we want to test on, in the test and execute the test. And then the most difficult is, well, what if the alarm goes off? What will we do? There's several levels of alarm, and really this is something where we leave the technical part and we have a policy thing, a governance uh, uh, decision that we need to make. So when all is good, well, yeah, we can just take the day off. Um, there might be alarms that are purely informational. Imagine you have 20 models and you have some time to check on one of them. Which one are you going to pick? Maybe the one where the drift score is the highest. Um, we might actually alert people, like send an email, you should look after the model at quality inspection station three, um, or you sh maybe the camera is not working, um, or we might have an alarm that says stop the machine. So if we're not sure that our, for example, our MRT diagnosis neural network works anymore with the current setup, maybe we want to stop using it and just use a machine that doesn't have uh, uh, the issue. What we want to do here has implications for how do we run this. So one thing is, well, software as a service is, is the new thing and we all want it in services. Um, but depending on what the data is really we're talking about, this might not be what you want to do with your data. Um, you could do it on your own machines in the cloud, in your own cloud, or on the ones that are controlled by you. Um, this integrates nicely with your other monitoring, and uh, it will also kind of, if you have models spread out through different sites, uh, it will allow you to aggregate your models nicely. Um, or, and this is in particular the case, if you want to have the option to stop the machines, 
then you very likely want to integrate tightly into where you run your AI models. So you want to move this on-premise and on the edge devices, on the very devices that uh, uh, deliver the predictions. And maybe you even want to refuse to deliver predictions uh, when the statistics say, well, we can't be sure whether it still works. Okay, so if you're convinced, well, this is something I should try. Um, so here is our, we built a little open source project here. The, uh, uh, a company and a, a great Italian company f where my uh, co-author Luca is uh, the CTO, Aerobix, and uh, Methanf, my company, we built Torch Drift, um, which tries to implement all the latest techniques like this partial matching uh, uh, for you. And uh, yeah, I'd love for you to check it out. If you want to have it, like a little bit more easy to use, ready to use, just show me where I need to hook. Uh, then we've also built a service solution that you can either run on your own machines or that you have. And it really tries to uh, give you both the current status, but also the history of the status. And then you can drill down and you can see how the latents are distributed and which ones are suspicious and can look at uh, what is what. Okay, so this was kind of the story from, uh, from why should we care more? And if you believe me now that there is something, there is a gap between, I've tested my model so it must be good, to, well, yeah, I need to make sure that the things I tested my model with are actually the ones I'm seeing in production, then, uh, yeah, then this was what I tried to achieve. Um, to my mind, drift detection is an essential part of deployment best practice for neural networks because it moves from, we just assume we tested the right thing to we check that we tested the right thing. So similar to the contract testing, uh, you move from, yeah, we tested something to we tested actually, we close the gaps in our testing. Um, the other message is, well, yeah, probably if we have more and more AI deployments, uh, you will see drift detection more and more. So if it sounded funny, today, maybe it will sound less funny and perfectly normal in two years. Um, it is still too much of an art in there. So what to detect drift on? Um, but there's also lots of progress too. So two years ago, I probably would have told you, yeah, you need to fudge the alarm level in order to do all things. And now we have more advanced tooling. Okay, with this, uh, thank you for your attention here.